five. Okay. All right. Hi, folks. This is Marcus Blankenship, and today I've got Nathan Powell with, of Newsy with me. Uh, Nathan is going to tell his story about how he made the oh-so-enviable transition from uh, services to products. In particular, Nathan's going to talk about the difficulties and challenges as well as the successes along the way and the myriad of things that he's learned. Uh, we're going to just get started here and we're going to let me grab something. I apologize for technical difficulties. Nathan, are you there? Yeah, man. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you? All right, right. I'm just actually I just check in my messages now to see if the the, the feed's up and running. Um, and apparently, at least some people can't see it. So, ah. oh, good to know. Where are you seeing that at? In uh, Newsy room. Yep. Well, that's not good. So we might just be entirely alone at this point. <laughs> we could be. Oh man, I, I love Google Hangouts. Oh, they're the best. Uh, I'm in the Newsy room too. I don't see anybody. Uh, I don't see anybody right now saying they can't get on. Where are you seeing that, sir? Uh, Michael. Ah. So, I wonder if. Okay, it's up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. Great. Okay, so Nathan, why don't you start by telling us, tell us a little bit about yourself and where are you located. Um, and uh, you know, how long have you been doing uh, freelance? How how long did you do freelance work? Well, um, my name is Nathan, and I've been a freelance designer for the last ten years now, almost. Um, started off work, working working in house through agencies, studios, you know, the usual, uh, and then went freelance in two thousand and seven. Um, but yeah, and that's 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 drawing to an end. Obviously, that's uh, that's why we're here to talk. But um, more about that a little bit. But right now, I'm in. I'm living in Spain, in Madrid, Spain. I've been here since 2000, so 15 years nearly, uh, in sunny Spain. And um, yeah, pretty much, pretty much left the design for pay sort of game behind, and um, started moving over the last couple of years more, more and more from from freelance project work to sort of more product orientated um, almost services as well to, to an extent um, and that, that's where we are now trying to try to build trying to build my or rather our SaaS Nusi. Now what is Nusi? Give us the give us the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch? Oh no you've got me there. <laughs> Nusi is um, Nusi's proposal software for, for creatives essentially I scratched my own itch uh, in 2013 and looked around at what was what what I was struggling with at the time, which was proposals, which were for me a nightmare. Um, I would invest huge amounts of time in in writing, designing, sending them out, trying to keep track of everything. Um, and it seemed like something that a lot of other people were struggling with. You know, I I, I spoke to studios and agencies in in Spain, and it was something that you know everyone was was uh, was fighting with and, and losing hours to. And so I decided to to put together something that would help me, you know, make the process a little a little less painful. Um, and that that sort of ended up becoming becoming Nusi. Wow. So you said 2013. So you've been doing it two years, at, at almost two years now. Is that right? Yeah. It it started out very much as a a side project. I was I was very much in that phase of I probably like a lot of people. I want a product. I want a product. I want a product. Um, I I <laughs> I was at that point now with um, with freelancing where I was thinking you know I'm not sure this is going to be a long you know an any longer term uh, game than it already was and I was I was almost I was almost desperate for an idea you know when you people start racking their brains for ideas and you know what can I do what can I do and you generally tend to spend all this time thinking about what that great idea could be as opposed to focusing on, in my case, what some of my own personal sort of problems were um, as they related to my, you know, sort of my uh, my work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and the initial came in, in 2013 when I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to try something. I realized this is, 
I, I hate writing proposals. You know, people often say, well, you, you must love proposals, you know, if you're, you're building a solution for proposals. I hated writing proposals, which was why I sort of attacked that idea. And, um, yeah, so we sort of, or rather I at the time, it was just myself, started planning out some some wireframes. I, I spoke to some people, like I said, some agencies and studios, a couple of freelancers, but not so much. And um, I thought, well, you know, it's it's never going to happen unless I try. So I said, right, okay, I've got a couple of grand. I actually had $2,500 that was a bonus from a previous client. Um, and I said, okay, that's what I'm going to invest in this MVP. And if it goes past that point, then fine. If it doesn't, that's how much I'm willing to, you know, to to lose potentially, which is not a huge amount of money, you know, by by most people's standards. But um, it was enough to get the ball rolling. Let's go back to that time. Yeah, I, I like what you said. You you were almost desperate for an idea, right? That you you were so. Just so I understand, you were a, a you're a graphic designer, a visual designer by trade, right? And mm -hmm. that's the kind of work you had been doing. Um, but but you said you didn't feel it was sustainable. Why not? What what made you feel like there's a lot of people that'll just do that forever? Yeah, I've never been I've never been happy with forever. Um, <laughs> I've I've Nuria, Nuria, my partner gets uh, she's very much you know routine. This is, we need to do the same things you know over and over for years to come. This is the house we're going to live in for the rest of our lives, and I'm the exact opposite to that, which. You know, you probably would think you know would lead to divorce, but you know, <laughs> over ten years, and here we are. But um, so I so I do like change for starters in a way. But I just got to the point where uh, sort of moving from project to project didn't seem like something I could or would want to sustain. You know, I, I couldn't imagine myself in my fifties and certainly not in my sixties um, designing websites and designing you know applications and software solutions for people. I mean. A, nobody would hire anybody of that age, I don't think. I th you have to be an incredibly famous, well-thought-of designer, I think, to be able to have that clout at that age. Um, you know, companies, startups, you know, there's a huge boom in startups now, and SaaS, and they go with the young kids, you know. They go with the movers, the shakers, and um, to be frank, I just couldn't picture myself as that 50-year-old, 60-year-old designer sitting on my computer still making money jumping from job to job you know I, I thought I want something that's going to be able to to take me at least a few years into the future and something that I'm actually going to be happy working on I mean it got to the point where I was just jumping from project to project I mean that's 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 the key it's yeah it gets tedious or at least it does for me I know some people thrive on it um, but no I, I needed something I needed something different and that came in the form of I need an idea <laughs> So Amy Hoy and lots of others are telling us now, you know, be careful with your idea. Don't give it, don't give it too much weight, right? Don't let the idea make you its bitch, as she would say, to be a little bit blue there. Um, with the idea that it's in her mind, it's not all about the idea. Did how how did you come about the idea, and how much credence and credibility did you give it at first? Um. Firstly, I think when she says, you know, don't make, <laughs> you know, don't give the idea too much power, I think she's quite right in that sense because we, we can get sort of hooked on the idea, you know, I've had an amazing million dollar idea and it's going to be the one I'm going to pursue because, you know, we get so tied to that idea that we don't see outside of that. And to be honest, I was never fully convinced that I wasn't, you know, married to the idea because it was my idea, it was my strongest idea at the time, it was a problem I was having. And it was something that I thought I could, you know, create a product or a service around. Um, you always have that. You always have that doubt. You know, am I too close to the idea? You know, is it actually something that people are going to pay for? Um, but of course, until you put something out there, you you don't know whether anyone's going to pay for it. Um, but I think I don't know. There there are so many ways to sort of, you know, people talk about you know idea validation all the time. You know, the, the startup thing is exploding and everyone has an opinion on something. Um, but I think sometimes as well as all this validation as, as doing research and talking to people, sometimes it does just come down to a hunch as well. 
and I know this is a difficult cutoff point because you know where's you know where's being married to an idea and where's being sort of sensible about you know what's actually going to give you any kind of return. And um, you know, I just thought, well, it is a problem for me. I know I'm not, you know, I'm not special. There are lots of people out there who have the same problems. I've spoken to some of them, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try this. And like I said, you know, I I I put a limit on what I was going to invest that initial investment, and I thought, well, you know, just put it out there and see what happens. I I think that's really smart. Um, I I'm a believer in hunches. Uh, I think that. But what I really like that you said is that you you went into it knowing how much you were willing to lose. Yeah, I uh, yeah I had put a, a specific limit on that, and I think there are so many ways of doing anything. But I think that's important. I think especially if you're not someone who is you know has a huge amount of money stored away, or you know you don't have a load of huge projects on on the on the horizon or something. I think it's very important to to set a limit and to realize that if a you know if it goes past this point it's just not going to be worth investing any more time in who knows maybe if you worked on it full time for the next two three four five years it would be profitable but how much money can you you know really afford to lose on seeing whether that's even a, you know a, a possibility you know you still have project work that is paying you money you know and that is getting you through to the end of the month and you know and even buying you nice things or, or whatever the case might be mm -hmm. um, I mean, they say I've never gambled, but they say the best gamblers are the ones who who set limits. They say, you know, I'm walking into the casino, you know, and I've got five grand to spend. That's it. Um, I don't know whether that makes a good gambler or, you know, just. <laughs> but that's what it is. Uh, that's exact. I mean, I don't spend five grand, but I go in with my single hundred dollar bill, and I tell my wife when it's gone, it's gone, and we're there fifteen minutes or something. So, <laughs> I, I think knowing your limits and thinking about it in advance. So, I'm curious for that twenty five hundred dollar investment, what did you get? Did you get an MVP, and and what did you do with it? Let's. Uh, what was the outcome of that? Yeah, I um. The first part of the process was to find somebody that could develop it for me because you know I'm a designer by trade. I gave it code a long time, and even the code that I did know then was be meaningless in in this kind of scenario. So, I did my best to speak to several um, Rails developers. Um, ended up going with a with a guy in the UK, and essentially we came up with a spec sheet. You know, this is what the bare minimum that the the service has to be able to do. These are the bare minimum functions. You know, if we can get past that, then great. And if we can't, we can't. Um, I think it was like you know a month for the for the original MVP. Uh, he was a freelancer as well, so he was doing it in his evenings and and spare time as well. And we did kind of get you know that initial usable just about product. Um, so I mean I'd already had I'd already started blogging because I'd, I'd been blogging for years before with my freelance career anyway. So I'd already started blogging. I, I bought the the domain newsy.com and, and and started blogging. Thankfully, so that was already generating you know sort of little interest. Um, I had the landing page up. I don't even remember particularly the landing page. I don't remember the landing page being particularly successful or anything at the time. But having those two there meant I had at least something in place. You know, so we had the MVP, which was. I mean, we can talk about this later, but it it was awful, right? Um, what? It was it, awful? I mean, you're so successful. How could it have been awful? Yeah, Did yeah. you just keep it and do a little rev and you're good to go? No, it, it, was, it, it was terrible from... I mean, it, bear in mind, it was like the first iteration. I've always, you know, even when I've worked on freelance projects, I've always tried to convince clients that nothing is ever perfect coming out the door. It's, 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 it's a continued series of iterations, you know, and, and revisions. So it was the first iteration or anything. It was the first iteration pretty much on the design. Um, I had no real idea who or what I was, you know, okay, I knew I wanted, I had designers in mind, but I had no real idea of the workflow. And unfortunately, the, the code was very dodgy, shall we say. It was, to be fair, you know, it was a small budget, there was reduced time, and the bugs were, there were probably more bugs than there were working features. So it was, yeah, it was, it was limited. But amazingly, I actually managed to get a handful of paying customers. Do you remember your first paying customer? I think actually my first paying customer, I think, was a, a guy called uh, Maurice Cherry. 
Uh, he runs a web agency. Uh, runs a podcast himself as well, and he's still with us now. Wow. So, yeah. That's a nice um, testimonial. Yeah, and I think actually we, we have another customer as well, David, uh, who was also on that very first MVP, and he's still with us now. All the rest flew the ship, you know, they, 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 they ran. But uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how much has changed actually over this last this last year or year or so. I know that in the last, um, I don't know, six, 12 months, you did a relaunch, right? Yeah, and that was in large part to the state of the MVP because it was the MVP was all I had all all I had I had no more money to take it further I'm not a developer so I was in a really really tricky position I was you know how how do I take this further um, there is obviously some interest there because you know people were, were, were willing to pay for its its current state so what could I do and I didn't have the money you know even if I'd been earning really well on client projects I don't think I could have afforded to invest in a sort of you know part-time developer or whatever. Plus, you know, when you're developing any kind of software service or any kind of you know online service, the the possibilities for things to go wrong are enormous. So, something something messes up in the middle of the night your time, uh, and people are using it on the other side of the world. What do you do? Do you just call the freelancer up on the phone and say, hey, this needs to be fixed now? It, it just doesn't really it doesn't really plan out. Um, so I started looking more and more at the possibilities or the options rather of a co-founder, um, but it wasn't something that sat well with me at all. I was, I was, I was scared. I think about taking. Oh, I was. I was scared about taking on a co-founder because Nusi was my baby. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was my idea, so to speak. Even though there are plenty of other software proposal solutions out there, and um, it was, it was a hard thing to sort of. It was a hard, it was a hard pill to swallow. But I knew that you know it's either going to go forward now or it's going to die. And the only way it can go forward is by finding a co-founder. And to be honest, I wish I'd done that right from the very, very start, because mm. we lost an awful lot of time. The whole reason that we sort of closed Nusi down early last year and sort of relaunched in September was because we tore everything down, every single thing. Nothing from the original MVP exists. Nothing. No code. No design. No user flows. No, not even the web page. <laughs> nothing. It was completely rebuilt. Um, and my co-founder, Michael Copa, he was actually still working part time at a startup while he was doing this. So again, this was all done in his spare time. Um, fortunately, circumstances changed later, and he ended up coming on full time at Nusi. And but that's essentially why we just closed the doors and said, you know, we are losing more customers. Mm. than we're keeping on a, you know, on a regular basis. So people were just coming in. Uh, we'd have people cancelling within 30 seconds. You know, they literally come in, sign up, and then you'd see them clock out again, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds later. And it got to the point where we said, we're going to run out of designers. You know, let's, <laughs> let's, let's close this down. Let's do it. Let's think about it. And, you know, and let's relaunch and, and sort of with something that's worth launching, you know. Yeah, there's a. I get this question a lot of, and the question is about taking on a technical co-founder. And I think a lot of people hesitate, like like you mentioned, because it is their baby. What advice would you give to people who are looking to take on a a, a, a technical co-founder or even a design co-founder, somebody to go in it with you? Um, like you you mentioned you would have done it earlier, but what other advice do you have for people considering that option? I think in my case, as I, was, as I needed a technical co-founder, I think it's very important that you speak to people who, uh, to friends who already work in that area. For example, at the time, because I know nothing about development. See, that's the problem. I can't screen a developer um, and know that what they're doing is good, you know? Um, I Even when we built the MVP, I had to rely on tests, uh, code tests that a friend of mine had passed you know, passed along and said, you know, get them to run these tests, do it live on the screen so you can see that they're not, you know, running off to Google or whatever. Um, and so I think it's it's very important that you have someone on your side, you know, within that industry, whether that be a designer or a developer, who can at least guide you through the process. Because I, me I remember at the time I was talking to Joel Friedlander from from Clinico in, in Australia, and, and it was essentially he, me, him that sort of talked me into, you know, 
a co-founder is not so bad. You know, if you want Nusi to, to survive and if you want it to, th to thrive, then you need to find someone, you know, as he, as, as he said, and as I say to everyone I sp speak to, you know, it's like, you know, do you want 100% of, of uh, nothing, you know, or 50% of something? And that was the sort of the phrase that sort of made me sort of turn around and think, well, this is going to have to be done. And I don't know, I mean, apart from having somebody in the area that can sort of hold your back, you know, sort of get you back and say, well, actually, maybe this designer isn't so great, or maybe this developer isn't so great, you know, from what, wherever that might be a, a technological, uh, or sorry, a technical uh, standard or uh, design or aesthetics or taste standard or whatever. But then there are obviously other things that are important as well, like, you know, do you even know each other? Um, do you have the same ideas about business? Uh, what does this person want out of your business? <clears throat> because everybody wants something, you know, and if there's a, if a company or a business or a product already exists and somebody else wants to come on board, which we're finding out more and more now as, as Nusi progresses, obviously those people are always going to want something. So you have to be very careful in, in finding out what that something is. Um, it was a very scary process for me and it was not something I did lightly, you know. Was my were you and Michael friends beforehand? No, we'd actually. Um, I was still. I was still consulting. Was this? I think it was early, late 2013, early 2014. I was still doing some consulting, and I was at a startup in Madrid, and I was there as product designer, and the lead developer was Michael Copa. And of course, and I was actually there for I was actually there for a good while. I was there for about four or five months, I think, when they were, they were redesigning their their app and their website and, and things like that. And um, of course, during the during that time, we we talk and I you know everybody asks, hey, so what's your side project? What are you working on? What are you know what's going to make you millions? And um, yeah, Michael just took an interest in what I was doing. And I think he'd already been at this startup as well for a few years as well. He I think he was their first employee. Um, and I think he was probably looking for a change as well, you know, something a bit more, you know, exciting, something that you could get in, into from the ground up, and something you could call your own. And uh, and that's 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 pretty much how how I found Michael. And it was actually Michael who approached me in the end um, mm. and said, you know, because he knew the problems I was having, and I, I'd actually I'd actually started paying Michael uh, as a freelancer on the side to do a little bit of work, and he said, you know, would you consider? taking on a co-founder, which is when they sort of said, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it. Yeah. Um, when when you guys launched, and uh, what was your main way of getting traction? And how has that changed to today? Um, well, as this was, as Nusi is completely bootstrapped, you know, 100%, the only marketing we ever did was content marketing. It was the blog. It was writing I wouldn't say lots and lots of content, but trying to be regular on the content, trying to you know get people to to come along, read what we're doing. We I think right from the very start, I'd offered the the free course. Uh, we run this five day free email course, which is uh, better proposals in five days. And I think and I if I remember correctly, that was actually up from the very beginning. So that would help bring people in to sort of at least learn about the process of writing better proposals, and of course at the same time, obviously help them to know about about Nusi. So I think, you know, the thing that actually, the thing that got us initial initial attraction was actually reaching out to people. This is when we're still MVP. I would actually email people and say, hey, I've got this product, come and have a look. Cold emailing is always Just cold bad. emailing. Yeah. yeah. Just cold email, like, hey, I, you work at an agency, I got your name off LinkedIn, yeah. check us out. Yeah, it was um, digital manual hard labor. It was just going from... <laughs> From you know, just collecting a list of, of agencies, I would I just go by city, you know. So I I I'd choose Chicago and just write into Google, uh, Chicago design agencies, pick out the emails, send them off. Obviously, the the ROI on that is terrible. But but, but you um, did get clients from that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think that uh, Maurice actually came from one of those emails when I reached out, I believe. But um, yeah. So I mean, past that, once once the sort of the the shiny new version came out. It was it was all content marketing. We didn't have money to do anything else, you know. Um, didn't have money for for adwords. Didn't have money for for advertising on Facebook. You know, cheap as it is, and for certainly no viral PR stunts and campaigns. And no, it, it's just 
writing, writing, and writing, and trying to be as helpful as you can to as many people as you can. And yeah. So recently, you have started creating some community building efforts for Attraction Channel. Is that, or or maybe it's not for Attraction Channel. Maybe it's for other things. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it it wasn't for Attraction. It was that because we're so small. I mean, with so many big players on the market, you know, you have got your bid sketches, your quote rollers, your uh, proposifies. You know, guys that have been around for years, or some of the guys that have been around for years. And they've got money behind them, or they've got teams behind them. They've got they've got backlinks to their websites coming out of their behind. You know, these are things that we can't compete with. We just cannot. Um, you know, we're two people doing the best we can, and that's it. So, one of the ways that we always sort of set ourselves apart right from the very beginning was with our customer service, because we were doing it ourselves. Obviously, there's no outsourcing going on. There's no there's no guy out in uh, the Middle East, you know, taking your emails. This is Nathan and Michael trying to be as on top of things as they can. So we would almost try and set ourselves apart on customer service, and not so much customer service, but just actually sort of being there with our customers. And one day we were actually talking to a friend of ours, and I think I think it was um, uh, Richard, who incidentally was also another designer at the same startup in Madrid at the time. Um, and at the time, I was th I was thinking of ways, you know, how can we try and sort of increase the the usefulness of Nusi? And I, I said to Michael about, you know, what about if we set up, um, you know, a community sort of, you know, with forums and and chats and topics and everything. And Michael quite rightly said that's that's going to be a nightmare. He said that's going to be impossible to run. That's going to be so much work, and we don't have the time. And then I was talking to Richard, and Richard just said, well, and this was in Slack. Uh, what about a Slack room, you know? And it was just like, well, yeah, exactly, a, a Slack room, that would be great. So we just set up the Slack room, set up a few channels, let some of our sort of um, earlier and, and um, what's the word, most active customers know about it, invited them in, and it, it just sort of went from there. And I think a huge amount of value has been created in that chat room. You know, we have customers in there who say, I just, I love the vibe that's going on in here. I love that... You know, you you and Michael are both here. That you're helping us, you're answering us. But the great thing is, as well, is that people are starting to help each other as well. You know, like you know, can I maybe can I get some feedback on this proposal? But things that are bigger than proposals as well. You know, we're not we want to be able to help our customers just be more successful. And if that's a proposal, then great. But if it's something bigger than a proposal, then even better. You know, we we've, we've got people helping each other out with feedback on their sites. You know, sort of being guinea pigs for others, promoting their content and stuff. And I think setting up the community has bought has been one of the the sort of shortest. Um, what's how would I say this? It's been one of the best return on investments for such a minimal uh, investment of time that we've done so far. Obviously, it requires a lot of time, you know, to be there and to be active and to try and get people, you know, talking and chatting. You know, which is always one of the sort of dangers of, of a community is actually getting people to to talk to each other, but it was a. Uh, it, we're so happy we did it, and I know a lot of people in the chat room are also happy that we set it up. So, yeah, I'm, again, I'm talking with Nathan Powell of Nusi N U S I I dot com, and um, Nathan, I, I really am. I'm a part of the the Slack channel, and I really have appreciated how people do help each other. There's a strong sense of community, and uh, I, I enjoy it in there. Uh, I, I think it's a great benefit for your customers. I want to turn to uh, a little bit more controversial topic now. Oh, no, no, no. Um, I know. I didn't, I'm going to throw you this curveball. So, so many SaaS owners and the gurus out there tell us, you've got to have a free plan. <laughs> you have got to have a free plan. Uh, I was reading this morning again, like that's one of the top pieces of advice given. But you don't. Why did you choose not to? Um... Because we want people to hate us. No, um, <laughs> why don't we have a free plan? Well, when 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 we first kicked things off, I mean, because let me go back a bit. I've I've one of the major sort of influences of me moving over from sort of uh, from services to products was uh, Rob Walling and Starts for the rest of us podcast, and particularly Rob Walling's book, uh, Start Small, Start Small, Stay Small, and 
they talk a lot, or in fact, Rob has always talked a lot about sort of getting a credit card up front for for any service because it's the ultimate validation. You know, it sort of shows that people are generally interested in using your product as opposed to just browsing. Um, so right from the very start, we had credit card requested credit credit card up front. A lot of people obviously get upset about that, uh, and I can understand those reasons. But we did. We actually did a test for a while as well, and we removed the credit card requirement from sign up, and ran that test for a month, and had zero conversions from trial to paid customer that month. Zero. Like, not one. <laughs> Wow. This was this was actually this was actually in the previous version of Nusi, so it's not you know, it's not conclusive, but it was enough for us to see that okay, we want to be asking for a credit card up front because we're not interested in browsers. You know, we want people who are actually looking for a solution. So to go to the plan then, why paid plans is because we're bootstrappers in part. You know, this product needs to be making money from the get-go. You know, a lot of people who have asked us, you know, oh, I'd love to try this product, but it'd be great if you did a, a free plan where you offered, you know, just minimal proposals a month or, you know, one template or whatever. But the fact is, and they would give examples of companies that do this, and all the companies they would give as examples are huge, you know, VC-funded startups. You know, we're talking, you know, Zendesk or whatever, or FreshBooks or... And the reason they give these free plans is because they need this continual growth but at the same time they have these they have the finance they have the money behind them to help push forward this free customer service time you're spending this free use on um, on servers you know that new free customers are, are demanding and they can afford to do that because they've got the cash and the money behind them to burn a bootstrapper just can't afford to do that you know we can't afford to be offering free plans and all the customer service that that involves as well because I mean, outside of development, you know, outside of developing the app, our biggest, our biggest, uh, what's the, what's the word? The, the area where we spend most time without a doubt is in customer service. Mm. It's, it's, it's staying on top of things, making sure that we can get to people as soon as we can, you know, giving them the help they need to, to help make them successful with, within Nusi. And, you know, time is money, so to speak. Yeah. We can't, we simply can't afford to run free plans, you know, and I just, I, I've just heard very, very, in fact, I've never heard a good thing about a free plan or a freemium plan within the bootstrapped world. Maybe if I, you, when you go up to funding, maybe, but in the bootstrap world, I don't know of anybody that's doing it successfully. I hear a lot of people say that's where 80% of your support costs are going to be, going to be used, that those, those freebies, um, they they are expensive for you as a company, and they and they don't oftentimes they don't convert well. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, this is why a lot more a lot more of the SaaS services out there, the SaaS products out there, their plans are becoming more and more expensive because they automatically want to cut that bottom tier out because it's typically, as you said, that bottom tier, whether that's free or just the bottom paying tier, do tend to generate more support requests. And are more likely to cancel than the rest of than the rest of the tiers put together, mm -hmm. um, which is why I think you see this trend as well uh, outside of funded, uh, sorry, funded startups, in these you know increasing prices. Mm -hmm. Let's turn. You you mentioned this idea of funded startups. Um, what is your viewpoint on taking investment at a company like Nusi? Have you have you considered it? Um, we've talked about it, but. Nothing serious. Uh, Nusi wasn't born with it, with the idea of, of finding funding or selling, you know, being a part of some huge acquisition. I mean, that's we're talking, we're talking, you know, years ahead or, or nothing ever happening. But strangely enough, the first <laughs> the first month we relaunched a a uh, what's the word a a funding I can't even think of the you know I have so little to do with that world that I, that I can't even think of the. One of the largest, one of the largest investor firms in, in America, emailed us the first month we launched and asked if we'd like to chat. So, <laughs> so I got all excited. I got, I got all excited about that, uh, thinking this is it. We're gonna, we're gonna sell the company after a month. And we're gonna make a million and and then on to the next. Um, but I think that was more to do with the way we present, we presented ourselves because we had, I don't know, we just done things well. They, they, they thought we were an established company yeah. but, um, 
but funding, I think, I think if you if you're going for funding right from the very beginning, it changes everything that you do, um, mm. because you no longer have to sort of amble along. You no longer have to um, only allow yourself content marketing as your sort of main traction engine, uh, traction channel. You know, so many other things become available, but at the same time, there are so many other things that come into play. You know, if you get funding, you know, they say you get, I don't know, half a million or a million or whatever, and all of a sudden, in my mind at least, things are then out of your hands, you know. There's an added level of stress. You, you know, you're no longer just answering to yourself or your co-founder. Um, if the money runs out and you're not at the figures that your funders, your investors were hoping it would be at, what happens? You know, we see this every day that <clears throat> these big companies, these big SaaS, these big startup, um, big startups that run out of funding, they, <laughs> they burn through all their money and they're still not making money, and that's it. So, I don't know. I just it's not something that I'm involved in or, or particularly interested in, and. I think it's an entirely different game. If, you, if you're looking yeah. at the products, you know, funded software, then you better talk to someone else. <laughs> that, yeah, that's good to know. I worked with a client once who got, um, who, who took about 1.7 million in funding at his startup. And what I noticed was in the three to four months after he got the money, um, he started to really think about who was his actual customer a lot differently and mm -hmm. I think that the actual customer became the people that gave him the money uh, rather than the people who he was providing a product and a service for and he became highly attuned to their wants and desires and, and actually ended up ignoring the place where he was going to actually build the company like his his actual audience in in favor of of trying to get more funding it became this vicious cycle about always wanting to please and, and, and let's do another round so yeah, I, I, I think, think that's wise yeah I, I gotta be honest I mean when I start when I see all these these funding tweets in my feed and you know such and such has just got you know a million or half a million or whatever it might be I just I, I go blank it's, I don't know it just doesn't mean anything to me and it's strange because in Spain I, I think startups only exist in Spain to to try and obtain funding I, I don't know really of any bootstrapped startups in Spain, it's all about funding, they want to get money, they want to get investment, they mm. want to go abroad. Um, no, it was just never, it just was never really a, a concern of mine. Okay. Um, so I'd love to hear about a problem that at in the time when you guys had the problem, you, you actually weren't sure you were going to figure a way out. Uh, I could figure a way, figure a way to solve it, but, but you did. Um, I, does anything come to mind when we think about one of these things where you wonder to yourself, is this going to be the death of us? Um, do you know, I actually haven't had one of those moments since before finding Michael because that was when I, that was the only time I thought this is, you know, this is either going to end now or I do something about it. And obviously we've had our ups and downs since you know sort of relaunching and, and getting this new thing out to market but the only time I've actually thought is this you know is this gonna be a is this gonna kill Nusi is this gonna stop me from moving forward was that whole moment between the initial MVP and what do I do now do I find a co-founder or do I just say okay sorry Nusi you know you're dead I honestly since then haven't had a moment where I've thought there's no, there's no getting past this. There's no, there's nothing. I mean, sure, there are lots of smaller things. I mean, we continually, we're at the point now where we're starting to outsource things, um, and that's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> I mean, just, just outsourcing, finding the right people. But I mean, these are all just hiccups. These are all processes that people learn and stuff. I think the only time I thought, right, it's going to die, was that it was, what's going to happen to Nusi now? And thankfully, Michael came along and hasn't been an issue since. Nice. Well, we have a question from the audience. Uh, someone asks, "I've been doing the game. I've been doing the game design for a few years, and now I want to make my own game. Where should I begin in order to make it a product? Do you have any advice for this person?" Well, game design, I don't know anything about, except that if he's if he's looking to start building his own games and to get things out there, I would say 
you know, keep, do it while you're still working on projects. Treat it very much as a side project until it no until it's no longer a side project. Because I think I think one of the things it's always it's always easy to see things in hindsight, and one of the hardest things to see going forward is you know where something's going to go, where is it, where is it going to end up? <clears throat> because if I look back now, I wish that I'd had a far bigger financial cushion behind me to have been able to have gone forward further with Nusi at the time. Um, so I think if you're starting to look to get into an area, whatever that area is, to always make sure you have that that sort of backup behind you, because you know yes, overnight success does exist, but usually there's five years of working your ass off behind that. So if you throw everything you have and quit your day job and say, up yours, boss, you know, and I'm launching my game tomorrow, that might be a very big mistake. So I would definitely say that I, I try and keep something a side project until it can no longer be a side project. It's hard for me to comment actually on the game inside because it's not something I've ever, I've ever been involved with. But um, yeah, go on. Did you do that with Nusi? I mean, you worked it part time for how many years? It, are you still working it part time? Is it still your side project? It's uh, it's tricky. Nusi is full time for both Michael and myself, but as it's bootstrapped and we still are not making enough money to be able to pay both ourselves and our families, <laughs> um, so we're occasionally still having to dip back into the the consulting uh, pot. Um, which is actually harder now than it ever was as a freelancer because we've essentially taken ourselves out of the game. Um, you know, anybody who's a freelancer knows that you have to continually keep your pipeline sort of alive and ticking along. But when you take five months off, what I've been doing is sort of uh, taking on a project, saving that money and helping that to fund my full-time work on Nusi and then coming back and grabbing another project so we can keep going along further. But of course, the longer you step away from the game, the emptier your pipeline is, and the harder it is to go back to. Yeah. Luckily, we're, we're starting to see now enough of an increase. Uh, you know, We're starting to get enough traction now that um, revenue genuinely is picking up, and it, it's actually picking up faster than we'd, we'd imagined it would. So we're pretty confident now that by the time the, this year finishes, that we'll both be uh, we'll both be 100% Nusi. We'll be you know getting paid by Nusi, so to speak, and that will be our our, our only focus. At so, the end of at, within 2015. With, yeah, by the end of this year. Yeah. So. Well, let's talk about traction and metrics. What is it you you measure? There's an awful lot of talk about lean analytics and uh, startup metrics. I mean, what? I, I guess what have you guys chosen to measure that you're actually really concerned with? We're very basic when it comes to metrics, <laughs> but that's that's largely to do with a lack of understanding. It's um, yeah, we pretty much suck on that analytics, but we do have, but we do have some baseline, you know, sort of uh, metrics that we that we always try and keep a track of. Obviously, we try and keep a track of our well, we do keep keep track of our general traffic because we know that there's obviously a direct correlation between the amount of traffic we're getting and the number of conversions we're getting. Or at least, or signing up to our free email course, or actually going to trial. Obviously, the more customers coming through, then the higher the conversion rate. Um, so obviously, we keep we keep an eye on that. We keep an eye on the number of trial signups to go through, and the number of trial signups that fail to go through, because as I mentioned before, we ask for credit card on signing up. So oftentimes, we'll get people sign up. <clears throat> they go past the first the first the first screen. When they get to the second screen and say, "Oh, they're asking for a credit card," then they'll sometimes uh, drop off the way, you know. So we keep a track on that. Obviously, we follow up with these people as well. And and then, obviously, we, we keep a track of sort of going from trial to paid conversions. We need to know sort of how well we're doing. Um, obviously, churn is a huge part of any SaaS and can eventually kill you if you don't get it under control. It's something we have to work really hard on this year because... I mean, we relaunched in September, but we relaunched with very much a bare bones. You know, Nusi can do this for you and it can do it well, but it was still a very bare bones feature set. Um, and this is something we need to continue building on for the rest of the year, which is hopefully going to help us as well at the same time reduce this overall churn that we have. Um, because churn obviously is a killer. You know, if you have a 5% churn, which is pretty low, you know, over the course of a year, that's over half your customers. 
Um, so it's it's a tricky one, yeah. Yeah. But I think yeah, I think just those very basic numbers that come through. You know, we keep a track of everything that goes along, and we try and just make sure that it's always pretty much going towards the right. Um, and up. I, I end up yes, the right as opposed to the right and down. But I, I it's something I it's something I actually really want to start learning more about. Everything's just an issue of time at the moment. Time is is just it's a killer. Yeah, you you guys recently you recently made more prominent on your homepage the ability for people to receive a um, like a sample, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, did, did that have any impact on, on sign-up or conversion? Um, a lot of companies do that. I'm just curious. Um, funnily enough, no, it didn't really. Um, it should have. It didn't, and it will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> part of the reason that it didn't have as much impact as it should have was through, I was going to say poor design, but I'll give myself a break. It was through... It was through... It was through. It, basically, we've seen through testing now what the mistake is, and essentially, if you go to the top of the newsy.com now, you'll see this. Uh, you'll see the hero section, and you'll see this. You'll see what appears to be a screenshot. Of course, it's so typical now in so many SaaS landing pages to see a screenshot of the app or the service or whatever it is, and people just take it for what it is, which is a screenshot. Of course, I thought, well, let's put the sign up within what appears to be that screenshot. And of course, people are just browsing over it. Um, so essentially, do you, find so, that it, do you find that if people fill it out and receive the the sample, though, do you have it? Do you track back their conversion rate once they if they interact with it? Um, yeah, we, we we keep all those numbers. We go through them on a weekly basis. So I see how many test proposals or example proposals were sent, how many of those uh, example proposals then went to a trial account, and then how many of those went to uh, on to become paid customers. So we do we do keep track of that. I think it's going to be interesting as well once we we make these next round of changes because it's all about changes and iterations and you know I think a lot of times and I'm sure a lot of the freelancers can bear witness, you know, a lot of times when you try and convince your clients that, you know, design and uh, is, a, is, a, is a process of iteration, it's a process of sort of, you know, um, seeing what works, what doesn't, and then improving on that and going from there. And it's essentially, you know, we're doing it pretty much every week on, on, on everything we're doing, and certainly the landing page, you know, we're seeing these things that aren't working. So the next step will be to you know, we're going to get rid of that browser-looking element and just have the form. And it goes against my better judgment as a, as a designer from an aesthetic point of view. But if it's going to increase conversions, then you know that's that's the end goal, isn't it? You know, it's um, so so you're not working just off your gut, which is, I mean, designers and programmers, all of us, we start with our gut. And so, ha has it been important for you to to actually have some history around those metrics and say this is what we're going to commit to watching so that we make decisions from real things not just from how we feel about it yeah I think it's if you know if you're not working from from numbers then you're you're either the best designer in the world or you or you're screwed um, and you and you're probably screwed because you know <laughs> if you just work in, if you just work in on a hunch then you know you, you could be changing any number of things and you have no idea what impact you're making um, so yeah, so we can see when those numbers from that top sign-up form go up and down depending on a change we make or depending on you know the, the copy that we use in the headline at that time. And it took me years when I was freelancing to 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 realize that good design wasn't just making things pretty. You know, I was always very much you know when I first started like I almost wore that sort of um, pixel perfect as a as a as a badge of honor and. <clears throat> And um, I think as you as you progress, you know, as you you work more and more years in in, in the industry, you you see that what people really care about are results. Um, it's like now with the Newsy landing page, I'm willing in my mind to let it be a little bit uglier if it's going to get the results that are needed. You know, um, it, uglier in my mind, obviously. But um, and those are provable results. Those aren't the yeah. opinion of your co-founder or your mother-in-law or whatever. Exactly. I mean, who's going to argue with results? I mean, right. Not anybody, not anybody successful. I wouldn't imagine. Yeah. So you chose 
this particular kind of customer and it seems like you've chosen the, the, the creative professional who works for themselves primarily or works in a small shop Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is the, I mean, if we say the lower bound of the size of the company is one, right, you've got some independence, um, what's kind of the upper bound of the, the kind of company you'd be looking for in terms of size or, or number of people, revenue? I think it's interesting because I think when we, you know, obviously when I had the idea it was I'm going to work with my people, I'm going to work with my sort of my peers because it was the natural place to reach out to. <clears throat> Obviously, it made sense because I knew people in that world. I was already blogging to those people when I was a freelancer, etc. You know, um, so yeah. So now we've got the we got from solo freelance consultants up to small teams, and I say the studios, the smaller teams that we're dealing with are probably their largest. We're talking about maybe ten to fifteen people actually, in the, you know, working at, at any level in the studio. And then obviously within that, you could have maybe a couple of people who are actually in project management or whatever the case might be. But the curious thing is that as we've sort of advanced and as we've moved along and as we've had more sort of data points to look at, we're seeing other people come in now from outside of what I thought our original sort of market was going to be. Um, and we're in the middle now of, of putting together some, some data because... You know, some of our most active users aren't designers, and while they may be creative in their in their space, is not somebody I would typically term as as a as a designer. Um, Can you give us an example of uh, the industries you're seeing? Yeah, well, we've got we've got people from uh, social media marketing agencies who who deal exclusively in social media. Um, we've actually got a, a sales team in. <clears throat> in the UK who, who sell uh, marketing for hotel chains. Um, we've got some really quite diverse people coming in and some really quite diverse people who are getting real value out of it and I never I never saw that coming. Um, so we're doing our best now or certainly over these coming weeks to try and evaluate all this information to see who our most active users are, to see you know the customers who have been with us you know for longer than say three months or whatever you know, actually do they think of themselves as designers? Do they think of themselves as entrepreneurs or developers or digital strategists? Or because I think you know, if we can, if we can hone our message a little more than sort of creative uh, independence or creative, you know, professionals, then I think it's going to give us a stronger foothold as well. You know, it's I, I'm a big believer in niche, you know, in, in going niche, uh, niche markets and specialising. So I think the the sort of the smaller we can make our market to a certain degree, I think the better for us is going to be. Because, you know, like I said, there are proposal software solutions out there that appeal to everyone. Um, or rather, at least in their, in, their, in, their, in their copy, they appeal to everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about that. Did, so did you, most people who I talk to, start with the belief that, for example, proposals... Well, every kind of company might need to put a proposal out, so we'll serve anybody that needs a proposal. So when I ask them, who's your audience, their natural answer is anyone who might create a proposal. But that doesn't sound like what you're saying. I am curious if you ever were succumbed to the temptation of thinking like that. Um, or from no. the beginning, did you start and no, say, right these the are my people? Right from the very beginning, it was designers. It was designers, and in fact, the very, very beginning, it was designers in Spanish. Uh, Nusi was launched in Spanish, completely, 100%. It wasn't in English, so if you wanted to use it, you either knew Spanish or you didn't. <laughs> so, um, how important has word of mouth been amongst bringing on customers? Has that been a factor? Uh, because I really believe that a given market, one of the attributes they share is that they, they have word of mouth. Yeah. And I think that's one of the values of niching down. Oh, totally. I think, actually going back to your previous question you know, about the sort of our biggest traction channel, I think after that original content marketing and getting those happy customers in, I think the word of mouth referral has been our biggest sort of our biggest play. Um, we we always ask new customers, you know, how they've heard about us, you know, how they've come to find us, and it's always really nice when you hear, oh, a friend or a designer friend was was talking about you, or you know, I heard you, or I, I found you on a, a Facebook post with somebody who was chatting about you, or we seem to be seeing that more and more, and I think 
I think once you get to that initial sort of word of mouth referral stage, I think for us it's a great place to be anyway because A, it makes you feel good because people are talking about you. But B, it's 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 a natural, you know, it's it's a natural progression of advertising and marketing without us having to do anything other than carrying on what we're doing with our you know with our customers at hand, you know. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we've only got about five minutes left. We have one more question from the audience, and then I have a, a final question for you. The question from the audience was, uh, what is something that you thought would be easy, which was actually very difficult? And I assume this is in the context of maybe before you started or in, in early stages, things you thought wouldn't be a problem that turned out to be pretty tough. Something I thought would be easy. Um... So I thought it would be easy. I don't know. Did I did I think any did I think any of it would be easy? Well, maybe not. Um, so I thought it would be easy. What about the inverse? Something you thought would be terribly difficult, a major hurdle to overcome that didn't turn out to be that difficult. Oh, that one's easy. That was <laughs> that was that one's customer support. Um, because I I dreaded that. I was I was dreading customer support. I'm not, you know, hard to believe as I'm sitting here all smiles and giggles. Um, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not the best at interacting with people, and certainly not people I don't know. I mean, I'm the guy that's pulled out his payphone at a paid conference, you know, within 10 minutes of arriving, you know, faking a phone call, walking out, and not coming back again. Um, wow, you've done that's an actual story. Yeah, yeah I did that last year. <laughs> um, so yeah, so for me, it's a really big thing. It's a really big, it's scary, but it's actually been. One of the I don't easiest is the right word, but it's been one of the most enjoyable, gratifying parts of of Nusi that I just was not expecting. You know, helping someone to be successful within a product that you've created is such a buzz. It makes you feel so good that it, it just pushes you forward to the next, and you actually, you know, you enjoy helping people. And we've we've also both been surprised as well, both Michael and myself, by. Um, how nice some of our customers really are, you know. They, I don't know if it's just because of the way we've presented ourselves from the start, you know. We, we make no bones about it. It's just Michael and myself. We don't pretend to be some big company or anything, you know. We, we make that very clear. And so the, sort of the tone and the emails and everything, it's just always been, it's like, wow, Michael, look, look at this email, you know. It's, it's so nice. And I think, yeah, I think without a doubt interacting with, with our customers and just, sort of we're side by side so to speak with them most days in, in the slack room and that was definitely the biggest surprise for me yeah. that's great that's great I, I can really see on your face that uh, it's a labor of love not a, a burden for you to to help them out yeah I mean who doesn't like you know helping other people to feel more successful you know and, and to accomplish things it's, it's a good feeling Absolutely. Okay, last question here. Tell us what's in store for Nusi in 2015. What do you have planned? <laughs> Give us the, the nickel tour of the big vision. Um, well, like I said, when we launched, we launched bare bones, so there are so many things that we've got going on this year. Um, and So, I mean, just this month, we've got digital signing coming on, uh, coming that is going to be pushed live, and obviously a lot of people have been asking for that. I've been asking for that myself. Michael's testament to that. Um we're going to be overhauling the entire branding capabilities and customization experience. That, right from day one, is one of the biggest reasons for people leaving Nusi, was for the lack of lack of customization options. And it's something that we've been wanting to get to sooner. But it's such a big, it's going to be such a big overhaul um, that it needs the time it's going to take. Um, but that's that's second up. Then what else have we got? We're going to be adding new templates, new starter templates new themes as well, so you can choose styles. Obviously, it's a bit limited at the moment. Certain people want to be able to do things that they can't currently do. Uh, going to be getting the dashboard coming, so you can see what's going on with your proposals, sort of acceptance ratings, how much money you've made in that month, sending out notifications and reports, letting you know, hey, you know, Bill, you've made, you know, you've made 5,000, 10,000 this month on your proposals, you know, 85% of them have been accepted, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and, and I, I could be I could be here for a long time. But we've essentially, 2015 is is when we're gonna really make an effort to sort of take Nusi to where we feel happy, you know, that it, take it to a place where we think it needs to be, 
Um, obviously, there's, there's no way it will get to a sort of a finished point because these things just continue and continue to sure. grow and to grow and to um, and to change. But we've got a big year ahead of us. We've got so much work to do, and uh, just can't wait can't wait to do it and 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 you know keep moving. Thank you so much. I've been talking with Nathan Powell of Nusi.com, N-U-S-I-I.com, a better way to send proposals. My name is Marcus Blankenship, and you can find my list at marcusblankenship.com slash list. Thanks for, sh thanks for coming along the journey with us today. Thank you again, Nathan. Bye-bye. Cheers, Bye. Adam. Cheers.